Hello again, everybody. It uh, feels like a lifetime since we spoke this morning. Uh, I've learned a lot, and this is the last session of the day, so I'll try not to, to go too long, um, but equally that means we've got a bit of flexibility. If you've got questions as, as, as I go through things, just, just help me. Um, so what we're talking about in this session is mastering organic matter analysis through FGICR mass spectrometry data processing. The title's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, also, don't worry, you don't have to master it by the end of the day. Uh, there's a tutorial tomorrow where you can learn a bit more if you're on site. Um, and there's a lot of nuance in FTICR data processing. Uh, it's not always as objective as some other things. Like a pH measurement is objective, uh, but this sort of stuff can be a little bit more subjective. So it's a little trickier to give hard and fast rules about things. And so one of the things I really want to get across is that as Monet progresses and as you engage with us, you're always welcome and encouraged to speak with us and ask us, you know, is this the right sort of analysis or are there any limitations to looking at it this way? Um, so whilst I'm up here now, we've got a bunch of other experts, experts around. So there's Cheng and Nicole, for example, as well as a bunch of other people here who've got lots of experience and expertise. So from this morning, we went through my philosophy of the major steps of an, any typical experiment, starting with how you design it, going sampling, sample prep, all the limitations associated with that. And then, as I said, I wanted to highlight the bottom two sections, the data processing and the data analysis and interpretation this afternoon. And you probably thought I got through those bits relatively quickly earlier. So hopefully now I give you a bit more uh, information to go with that. So the first section is about raw data processing. And most of the time as Monet users, you're going to, we'll do this for you. And you're gonna get processed data out. But it's important, as I mentioned, to understand how that data comes to be so that you can interpret and contextualize it appropriately. So this includes a few steps here, which we're gonna walk our way through. So I didn't go into how FTICR works this morning, and I don't really wanna go into it too much right now. It's kind of complicated in itself. But the actual information the instrument records is what we call a transient or a time domain signal. And so we have to do various uh, functions to it, such as appetization, zero filling, before we do a Fourier transform. And that's where the name Fourier transform line cyclotron resonance comes from. It's because we're measuring time domain signal and we want to get the frequency domain information out of that. This might seem a little bit abstract, um, but this frequency tells us about the mass to charge ratio of those ions. And the way that it does that is with an instrument specific calibration function. So as the question this morning was asking about seven Tesla versus other instruments, in the case of FTICR, not only do you have instrument specific calibration coefficients, but you've got properties just like the magnetic field, uh, higher magnetic field, the ions move faster, they have a higher frequency, and therefore you've got different calibration functions. But whatever function you use converts it from this frequency domain to this M over Z domain spectrum. And so this is obviously the, the feature that we're interested in. Again, almost all of this is done behind the scenes automatically, but it's important to know that, you know, we're not directly measuring the mass to charge of an ion, we're measuring the frequency at which it moves in our, in our instrument. The next thing that we obviously have to do, basic signal processing, such as noise thresholding um, and peak picking. And what this really is about is a lot of the data that is captured is not necessarily information you wanna handle downstream. These spectra that we acquire, may have 8 million, 16 million, 32 million data points, but we obviously want to summarize that in a smaller format. Part of that is peak picking. And so what that means is extracting out of the spectrum the exact mass to charge ratio for the peak, its height, its resolution, and so on and so forth. And so what we're talking about here are some terms that might come up again and again, or you might see occasionally. So for example, the mass to charge ratio is this, is this exact center point of the peak. So it's the centroid or the center of this peak that obviously has a finite, uh, an explicitly finite width, like it's not infinitely narrow. Um, the intensity is the peak height of that, that, and the resolution is this width defined at half the height of the peak. So you might see the term res resolving power, you might see the term resolution. Oftentimes people use those interchangeably incorrectly, and I'm guilty of that just like everyone else. Uh, but generally speaking, the resolving power is actually these, this width at half max divided by the M over Z. So you get a number on the order of 100,000 or a million. 
And the bigger the number, the narrower the peak. <laughs> so once we've done that, we've got our peaks out of our spectrum. Uh, we've got various properties associated with them. And as I've already said, we've got them in the mass domain. But the problem is the measured mass to charge value from that initial calibration is not exactly correct because there's some, some source of uncertainty or error. Part of that is just due to instrument drift. You know, if I calibrate an instrument on Monday morning, by Thursday afternoon, it might be behaving slightly differently. Part of it is also due to various physics effects that are happening inside the instrument. Um, interactions between the ions in a finite amount of space, it's described as space charge effects, but basically that shifts our peaks from where they should be. And so a critically important step is called mass recalibration. And so what that means is that we look at data points within our spectrum and we know what they are for some reason, whether they are compounds we've spiked in, whether they're known contamination species, or whether we've characterized these samples so much, we know the types of molecules that are gonna be present. From that, we can recalibrate the spectrum, and that allows us to really narrow in on what our residual uncertainty is with the measurement of that peak's mass. So for example, in this top right panel, is a uh, scatter plot showing the, the measured mass to charge ratio and the error. And this error is the distance between the measured mass and the theoretical mass for that assigned formula, that whatever molecular formula is. And you can see in this circle, I've highlighted the real uh, correct assignments, but you can see that they have this rather large spread of about two parts per million, and they're not centered at zero, which means that all of our, our data is going to have this slight uncertainty. But once we've done our recalibration, these data points are now centered at zero and the spread of errors is significantly reduced. But no, the spread of errors is not zero. There is some uncertainty associated. You might think this is all very um, esoteric, but it's important because this uncertainty obviously plays in downstream with our further analysis. That said, um, our residual errors should be less than one ppm with our instruments and our methods, we actually aim for less than 0.1 ppm uh, because we're pretty pretty good at running our instruments. And so where does this come into play? So again, we want formulas from masses and we can do that because we know the exact mass of isotopes with a high degree of accuracy and precision. These are, you know, people have run this at the highest uh, possible accuracy. We've got many decimal places of accuracy and precision on these values from say NIST, but our measured values might be out by one part per million, which approximately think fourth decimal place in this. And so when you start looking at these numbers and you can see that these are precise to at least six decimal places, we've got this margin of error, this uncertainty associated with it. So when we're talking about how do you turn a mass into a formula, we've got a range of possible formulas that a mass could be. And so what we have to do is we have to constrain that search based on heuristics. And most of the time, these are a combination of chemistry and environmental knowledge or sample specific knowledge. So for example, we're doing organic matter. So it's gonna be an organic molecule. It's gonna have at least one carbon. They're probably gonna have more than one carbon. Um, we know that the ionization technique we use, electrospray ionization, especially in negative polarity, is gonna give a lot of oxygen containing species. And so we can start to set these rules like must have at least one carbon, must have at least one oxygen. Um, typically, you're not going to have things with a lot of phosphoruses because phosphates tend to be lost fairly easily, either through environmental processing or through ionization. So you might have one phosphate, but you're unlikely to have 10 phosphates. And so that sort of thing allows us to constrain our search. And so when we do formula assignment, there's a whole bunch of software tools. Um, for the purpose of visualization, I, I, there's an example website from ChemCalc where you can put in a mass and it will tell you all of the possible formulas that come out. Obviously, we don't do it by hand, by pen and paper. Um, and so if we have this mass here of 194.0805, there's only one formula that's within 5 ppm. So you could be pretty confident that that formula is the correct one. These other species are you know, much larger errors, relatively speaking. But if we go to a bigger mass, and this is a screenshot from a different program, Brooker's data analysis software. So this mass of 507, there's actually three possible chemical formula within one PPM. 
Now, if you look at these and you're a chemist, you might immediately want to rule out the middle one. It's got 14 nitrogens and seven hydrogens. It looks incredibly condensed and probably quite explosive. So it's not likely to be in our system. And the one, despite the fact that it's actually got the smallest error. Um, so we, we have two other options. This one at the top and this one at the bottom. Here, it becomes a little bit more subjective. And that's what I mean by there's, there's some level of uncertainty, some level of, uh, I was say hand waviness, though I'm hand waving a lot. Um, the, we know it's this C22 uh, H19014 species. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons we know it, but we can make these assignments. So as I said, it's not really exact. Um, and in complex mixtures, there's a lot of uncertainty or there can be some uncertainty. So you've got things where there could be multiple possible assignments within the mass tolerances you've got within the heuristics you defined. You might not have sufficient resolution. So one of the things I didn't really touch on is that you don't have infinitely high resolution at every mass. And in fact, as the mass increases, the resolution decreases. And so we've got more uncertainty in mass as well as possibility of overlapping peaks to not be resolved. Whilst at higher mass, there's more possible elemental combinations. And so you've got this challenge that at 200 M over Z, we can get a pretty good assignment. At 600, we can get a good assignment, but like at 1,000 or 2,000, it becomes a lot more uncertainty about what those things are. Now, one of the historical conventions was we just say, this is the best match, it's a close match, this one peak is this one formula. But what I would encourage is people to think a little bit more open-minded, quote, embrace the ambiguity and accept that sometimes when we don't know for sure which one it is, we just have to treat it as both possible assignments. Um, that said, there are other ways to improve our confidence in it. So if you're not a mass spectrometrist, you might not be aware that not only can we detect our species, but we detect isotopes of those species or isotopologues. So in this case here, we've got glucose uh, with 12, uh, 12 C, six carbons, all of the monoisotopic form, carbon 12, and the same for hydrogen, same for oxygen. But we also can detect and resolve with high resolution mass spectrometry, these isotopologues where we've substituted out the carbon 12 for a carbon 13, or a hydrogen for a deuterium, or an oxygen 17 for an oxygen 16. And these species appear at this precise, precise position and relative intensity as theoretically predicted. And so we can compare these patterns predicted to measured to help add confidence to our assignment. That said, as you probably know, oxygen 17 and deuterium are very low natural abundance. And so we don't always, and in fact, we quite commonly don't, detect enough isotopologue features to get a great degree of confidence. But we have this as an additional metric that we can use, especially when we're doing more targeted type of analysis. One thing to highlight is that um, in Core MS, which is the software we use, it automatically calculates these confidence scores for you. Then uh, the final critical step in data processing before we get to interpreting it is how do you combine data sets? So if you think about, if you've ever done principal component analysis or anything like that before, you've got a table of variables and observations. So that might be soil sites and formulas annotated. But how do you make sure that you're aligning those entries across sites the same way? And so there's two historic, well, there's two sort of philosophies on this. Historically, you would take all of your masses before you do anything else with them. And if the masses are close enough, between samples, you say that those masses are the same, and then you aggregate them on this pre-assignment alignment. Uh, or you can do it the other way, where you treat every spectrum independently, process every single spectrum, and then if the formulas are assigned the same, you align them based on formulas. And there's pros and cons associated with those approaches. The first one, you could obviously, it's a big assumption, the masses that are close between different samples should be the same mass. Uh, and it can artificially align features that shouldn't be aligned. But if you don't do it that way, then any unaligned, any unassigned features may are essentially can't be used. And so if you remember uh, Malak's talk this morning, she was talking about ways to make inferences about even unassigned species, these transformations or relationships between these species. 
But in the second approach, you can't do that. You essentially lose or sacrifice that information. Um, in terms of data processing software, so we've got Core MS. This is an internally developed software at Emsel, but it's open source, it's Python based. What's really nice about it and what the main driving force behind it is, is that it allows for a complete end-to-end -end workflow. So you can read in raw data in vendor proprietary format, do your entire processing workflow and get your output data in one routine, which means that it's fully auditable, you don't lose metadata, you can reproduce that code uh, anywhere and you'll get the same result. Whereas any other tool which involves you to export from one software to another to another, you obviously lose information at each step. That said, there's other tools that exist, including some proprietary options and some open source options. Uh, as, uh, and you may be familiar with some of these, depending on uh, if you've done this sort of work before. So once you've done all of that data processing, especially if you've not tried to combine data sets yet, you end up with an output that looks a little bit like this. So what we have here is every row is a peak in that data set. And it has a certain property, such as its measured mass or its recalibrated mass or the theoretical mass of the peak if that peak was assigned a molecular formula. Uh, it's got properties such as its height, its resolving power, which I've mentioned, signal to noise. But then there's all of these other properties which are derived from the molecular formula that was annotated to that peak. So this top row here was assigned a formula of C11H10O5. And we also know a few other things about it, such as what's the confidence in that assignment? How many double bond equivalents are there, et cetera, and so on. So with that, uh, we've got to the end of the data processing step. I wanted to show you that to really stress some of the, the key caveats or considerations with it, but I'll remind you that most of the time, Monet is going to do this for you, and what you're going to get out is something like that last slide. Um, in the next section, we're talking about data analysis and interpretation. So what do you actually do with that information? And I want to talk about a number of things, starting with just basic metrics about the spectra, the stoichiometric properties, which have already been discussed this morning, but a little bit more detail about them. Uh, some common visualization approaches, although by now we've seen actually a range of them. So this is, you know, just a sort of reminder or a final teaser. Uh, statistical analysis. And then quite importantly, peak intensity usage. So one of the things that has been alluded to is the use of presence absence or the use of actually using the intensity of a peak uh, quantitatively or not. And so at the end of this, I'm gonna highlight the considerations associated with that. So in terms of spectrum metrics, uh, this often is just used as a sort of a QA, QC type thing. We acquire a spectrum. One of the things we often talk about are how many peaks are in the spectrum. So in this case, we have a spectrum of Swanee River fulvic acid, which is our go-to QC sample. In this particular case, there was about 10,000 peaks detected, and there was about 3,500 peaks which could be assigned a molecular formula. Now, you might think those are this big disparity, and there probably is. It should be a little bit higher. Um, but these can also give you some insight into the quality of the data or the amount of features which we're not able to assign. We've got some metrics to do with the quality of assignment. So for example, the root mean square of our recalibration function or the mean absolute error of our assigned masses. Um, again, as I mentioned, these should be less than one PPM, but for us, typically we're aiming for this 0.1 PPM level. And then there's some other, other things like total ion current, just as a how much signal is there. And the skewness of MZ distribution, this is a bit esoteric, but you might have noticed a lot of these spectra have a sort of normal distribution shape to them. And one of the metrics we can use to compare, especially our QCs, is, is that skewed normal distribution the same skewed normal distribution? Does it have the same mean? Does it have the same skewness? Uh, we can also look at, just as I mentioned before, the distribution of oxygen numbers in each assignment in our spectrum. So for stoichiometric analysis, um, as has been alluded to already, the ratio of elements in the assignment allows us to make inferences about the chemistry of the molecule. So in the simplest case, and, and anyone who knows any chemistry is aware of this sort of thing, you can just look at how many hydrogens to carbons there are. And in the extreme case of methane, which has got 
four hydrogens and one carbon, an uh, HC ratio of four, it's, it's a saturated molecule. In the case of benzene, which is an aromatic ring, it's got a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's, a, it's an intrinsically unsaturated aromatic molecule. The extreme example of a buckyball of C60, there's no hydrogens, and you've got this zero ratio, which is extremely uh, aromatic. Um, but we can be more sophisticated because we've got more atoms and more, more context to it. So as an example, I already showed this, but there's a number of different numbers that we can calculate based on a, a single formula. In this case, caffeine, which if you're anything like me is getting through the day. <laughs> so um, thinking about the HC and OC ratios, one of the most common ways that they're used is in these van prevalent diagrams, wherein each assigned molecular formula is plotted as a glyph on this two-dimensional scatter plot, according to the ratio of hydrogens to carbons and oxygens to carbons. Uh, this is based off of some work done in the 1950s, and this use is very different to what uh, Van Krevelen had back in uh, back last century. Um, but there's, it's actually kind of a clever way of getting insight into the type of chemistry present. It's also a neat way to generate a single figure fingerprint, if you will, of a sample. If you look at the whole spectrum and there's 10,000 peaks, it's hard to, to figure that out. But in this plot, you can actually see how they fall chemically. There's also these putative annotations, uh, whether it's a lignin-like molecule or a lipid-like molecule. And we'll talk a little bit about that more, but suffice it to say, what we're not saying, this is the tricky bit, we're not saying that that peak is a lignin molecule. We're saying that that peak falls in the same area as a lignin-like molecule would fall. And so we can infer that it's like a lignin molecule. We can't say it is a lignin molecule. This is especially important if your definition, for example, includes protein. So proteins don't typically weigh 300 Daltons and have no nitrogens, but this plot would put elements there. So you have to keep in mind this sort of uh, caveats associated with it. The other caveat is that everyone has a slightly different definition. Um, so this paper in 2018 that came out from PNNL explored some of these limitations I already mentioned, where you shouldn't really call something protein-like if it doesn't at least have a nitrogen in it. Um, likewise, they added a class of nucleotide, but you shouldn't call it that unless its mass is within a very specific range, because otherwise it's not a nucleotide. Uh, more recent work in 2022 in JASMIS or in phytochemical analysis has explored different definitions for these different regions and these different ranges. So as you can see, there's no singular definition across chemistry. Um, and whatever definition you do decide to use, you really have to define it in your paper so that everyone knows what you're doing. Um, and obviously, some of these are specific to the type of research. So this particular project on the left was more interested in omics and metabolomics. These ones on the top right were more interested in soil or organic matter in general. And this one here is clearly about uh, phytochemicals. So the renaissance of these plots, so they originally, the 1950s Van Crevelin uh, was nothing like what you see today. And there's really these two key papers from the early 2000s that redefined the plot to be as it is today. Uh, and people have extended this a number of different ways. So you can color code them or size code them. And we saw Leighton's presentation earlier where he showed you can color them by different properties. There's interactive visualizations. There's all sorts of ways that you can use these plots. Um, depending on how you want to explore the data. So in this case, I color-coded them by mass to charge ratio, since that isn't captured in a normal Van Krevelen plot. And I sized the glyphs according to the intensity of the peak. Uh, as a final look at the Van Krevelen diagram before we move on, I have these sort of six example molecules, um, which hopefully you're all familiar with sort of reading a, a chemical structure. But this is really to give you an idea of where a molecule you might think, where it might fall here. So you've got something like palmitic acid, a lipid, that is in the top left corner. You've got n acetyl glucosamine, which is in the top right corner, where our carbohydrates tend to be. You've got elagic acid, which is two gallic acids stuck together. It's obviously condensed, it's aromatic. That's falling somewhere low, somewhere in the middle. Uh, caffeine is over here. So you can sort of figure out this to sort of map out where you think molecules might be. But then we've got other equations. So all of that so far was just about the ratio of hydrogens to carbons and oxygens to carbons. Double bond equivalence, DBE, uh, you've probably all heard of this. It's been around forever. 
This equation I'm showing up here, uh, the next few slides have these sort of useful summaries in my mind. Uh, you can see the equation here factors in the number of carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, and phosphorus. Doesn't include the number of oxygens. And so one of the big limitations with double bond equivalents is this lack of consideration of a key component of organic matter. And on the left-hand side, I'm showing again a subset of these structures and what their calculated double bond equivalents are. Um, and what it really shows you is a, the sum total of the number of rings and double bonds. So down here, we've got one ring and one double bond, and it comes out with two. Um, I won't go through this one. The other way that people use this is by normalizing it or showing it relative to the total number of carbons. And so they can either do it by calculating DBE divided by C, or they can just plot double bond equivalents versus number of carbons. So that's what this figure on the left is. It shows you this uh, relationship between how many double bond equivalents a specific formula has with how many carbons it has. And depending on the field of chemistry, you can interpret these plots slightly differently. The petroleumics or petrochemical industry has some very specific interpretations of this. And sort of there's this uh, hypothetical limiting line where things won't fall below. Um, the other way, which is perhaps more um, interesting or intuitive, is to think about how does the distribution of these values differ between samples? So this is an example taken from uh, tomorrow's uh, tutorial session, looking at the distribution. So this is our kernel density estimate plot, uh, distribution of DBE values within a top sample from the top of a core and within the bottom. And you can see that there is a different distribution here. And what this shows us is that the bottom part of the soil has a higher double bond equivalent average, which may be the case that further down in the core, there were more aromatic structures or more unsaturated bonds, perhaps more recalcitrant molecules. Versus at the top, you may have more labile species, more uh, fully saturated lipids or metabolites. An extension of double bond equivalents came out in the mid 2000s, uh, aromaticity index. This is uh, very popular. Um, there's limitations associated with this as well, but one of the critically important things is that this does now include oxygen in the equation. And you get a number that between zero and one, if it would fall below zero, it's set to zero, and if it falls above one, it's set to one. And what we make is this interpretation of if it's less than 0.5, the molecule average is aliphatic. And if it's above 0.5, the molecule average is aromatic. And above 0.67, it's a condensed aromatic. Now you might notice there's three equations on here, and that's because it's not a perfect equation. And there's uh, assumptions made with this. So in the original paper from 2006 and an important correction from 2016, these two equations are presented. And the second one, modified aromaticity index, is generally recommended over vanilla aromaticity index, uh, but it makes an assumption that half the oxygens are pi bound and half the oxygens are sigma bound. Basically, only half the oxygens are relevant to the question of aromaticity. But that assumption was made on a specific type of organic matter. And so in 2022, another research group did a more extensive uh, comparison and essentially assert that that value, that 0.5 multiplier here, is somewhat sample specific. And there's actually a slight subjectivity there, depending on if your sample is marine DOM versus soil organic matter or whatever. So there's some, some uh, uncertainty to be had in here. And you can see how this equation changes. For example, chlorogenic acid, which has clearly got an aromatic structure. The normal aromaticity index says that it's zero, but with the refined modified one, it comes out with some aromaticity. The elagic acid, which I would say is somewhere between aromatic and condensed aromatic, in fact, falls in that range with these equations. And something like this N acetyl glucosamine correctly has zero aromaticity index in both cases. Uh, again, how might you visualize this? So, one of the things I've shown here is a hex binned plot or hexagonally binned plot. One of the reasons I like this sort of visualization rather than just a scatter plot is because we've got 10,000 peaks and you can't fit 10,000 points in a two inch figure in a paper because they all sit on top of each other. And so instead, what you do here is you aggregate the points into this discrete bins. And that allows you to see the true distribution or the true density of these values across a sample. 
And you can see that in this particular case, the vast majority of the species annotated fall in this aliphatic range and only a small subset fall in the aromatic or condensed aromatic range. And again, we can compare the top and bottom of a specific soil looking at this distribution. And if you can remember back, the double bond equivalent showed a very discrete difference between top and bottom, where bottom had higher DBEs. In this case, it's more nuanced. And you see that the top does have a slightly bigger, slightly more features with the lowest aromaticity, which is what we would have expected from DBE analysis. But the uh, top also has more species in the extremes of aromaticity. And so there's different interpretation from this than you would have got from the DBE analysis alone. Now, NOSC is something we've already mentioned a couple of times this morning. Uh, I find this to be one of the more challenging ones to get my head around. It's a thermodynamically derived property. Um, again, what we're factoring in is the number of carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens, phosphoruses, and sulfurs, um, and Z, which stands for charge. And what we're trying to do is estimate what's the amount of bioenergetic potential of a compound based on its formula. Uh, and this can be used to rationalize how stable something is, how much it resists, or how easily it's biodegraded or, or plays a role in degradation. Of course, big uncertainty is that you're trying to do thermodynamics without structure. So there's a caveat associated there. Um, and the NOSC values for five molecules are shown here, where you might see the chlorogenic acid and n glucosamine both have a NOSC of zero. This elagic acid, which is more aromatic, more condensed, has a slightly positive nominal oxidation state of carbon. And these uh, more metabolite-like molecules, leucine, which is obviously an amino acid, and palmitic acid, a lipid, have more negative um, NOSC values. I strongly encourage you to have a look at this original paper from 2011, which introduced the concept. They explained their methodology and rationalization, all looking at half, uh, half equations and redox potentials of all sorts of different species. Um, it's a very powerful technique, but again, it's one of these things that I find takes a little bit more thinking about to interpret than some of the other ones like double bond equivalents, which are much more uh, straightforward. That said, and um, we've actually seen both of these figures already today, so this is going to be a great slide. Um, there are ways to interpret it in different ways. So a uh, Callaway paper from 2016 shows this nice figure, which puts putative annotations in a NOSC scale. And so the, the origin of this figure is really um, the species annotated where they fall in a bad prevalence space, so it's a lipid-like molecule, and then when that formula would be in a NOSC space. So you can see how we're like feeding together and connecting these different metrics. And that kind of shows what we saw before, the lipids, for example, on uh, amines are slightly negative NOSC, and maybe some things like aromatics and tannins are slightly positive NOSC values. Uh, I won't go into this one again. I, I think we've, we've mentioned this already a couple of times. The Gibbs free energy or Cox Gibbs free energy this is derived from NOSC values, and this is another thermodynamic uh, metric we can use. Um, it's essentially NOSC multiplied by a factor and then, you know, adding another number. And it's, uh, it might seem a little bit hand wavy as an explanation, but again, I refer you to the original paper where they derived it. You might recognize this as the form Y equals MX plus C, and essentially they took a whole bunch of empirically derived information and calculated this relationship between NOSC and Gibbs energy from known molecules. And then from that are estimating the Gibbs energy for species based on formula alone. And what this allows you to do is just put units to these numbers. So again, if the NOSC value is the same, the Gibbs free energies are gonna be the same. So it's essentially rescaling this in some factor where you can see that leucine has got the highest Gibbs energy and the lactic acid has got the lowest Gibbs energy. One other thing to note is these coefficients are derived at 25 degrees Celsius at one bar in, you know, space. Maybe this doesn't hold true. So just keep that sort of caveat in mind. So uh, statistical analysis is uh, complicated and uh, can take a bunch of different forms. We've already mentioned a few different options so far today. Ordination analysis, dimensionality reduction, for example, principal component analysis or principal coordinate analysis, 
Um, and this can be using formula level information, i.e. the presence or absence of features in a data set or the intensity of those features across data sets. Or you can do traditional statistics, such as, for example, these t-tests or ANOVA or whatever you want to do. Um, referring you back to, to these two papers, which show some examples. Uh, this paper up here was an interlaboratory study, which I'll mention a little bit later. This paper was uh, one of the other case studies I provided this morning. Obviously, uh, consult a statistician if you aren't sure. Uh, always feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we, we wanna make sure that the data is interpreted as correctly as possible. And with really rich data, it's really easy to do something a little bit more than you should. Um, so I definitely recommend careful consideration here. So one of the big caveats with FTICR data, especially direct infusion, uh, that means there's no chromatography, it's just we're just injecting the sample straight into the instrument, is the question of reproducibility and repeatability of a measurement across time. Now, our conventional approach is run the whole sample set at once. And that way you eliminate that and run the samples in a randomized order, especially if it's a time series study. Uh, but that's not always possible, especially when we think about Monet, we're going to be thinking about how do we compare data sets acquired now with data sets acquired in two years. And so it's important to note that we don't have a perfect solution to this yet, um, but we have some guidance on how to do this based on previous work or interlaboratory comparisons. So this um, paper that came out a couple of years ago, they sent, 20 or, uh, they sent half a dozen standards to 20 or so labs including uh, EMSL here, and we analyzed the samples per the same protocol. And what we got was a measure of how variable the same samples are acquired at different labs on different instruments, but also some really useful metrics in terms of how do you compare data sets or how might you normalize your data set to a QC standard. So I strongly recommend you uh, take a look at that paper. And then the the final sort of big theme is the question of peak intensities. So I mentioned a bunch of times that we've got an intensity or a peak height, um, and they're obviously not arbitrarily random. You know, the, the intensity of a peak means something. The problem is it doesn't mean one-to-one -one that much ion was that much molecule in your soil. And there's a whole range of reasons why we've got this non-quantitative response. So for example, extraction biases, if you use water to extract versus methanol to extract organic matter, different things are gonna extract different. You've got these solid phase extraction biases. The sorbent we use, the protocol we use is biased towards certain types of chemistry, which may be more preferentially retained uh, versus other ones. We've got matrix effects. So even though we do a water extraction and even though we do our um, SPE cleanup, the presence of all these different molecules in the same in these samples are matrix effects. There's different composition going on. And that relates as well to the ionization efficiency. Some molecules just ionize better than others. Uh, therefore, they will have more signal than others. Some molecules are suppressed by the ionization of other molecules. And so a signal can appear artificially lower than it should because of the presence of another species. And then, of course, there's a whole range of instrumental biases. Um, we can use mass spectrometry to look at intact proteins, and we can use it to look at really small molecules. We can't do both at the same time because we tune the instrument to do a specific thing. And that tuning biases to us towards a specific type of chemistry, a specific mass range of interest. So if you do decide to use peak intensities, you have to be very cautious in how you do that. One of the big questions that comes up is, well, which peaks can you compare? So this figure, uh, we have a preprint out on uh, EGU sphere at Biogeosciences. Um, and we, it's kind of, a, it started out as a don't ever do this, but then we evolved it into a, well, if you want to try and at least think about it this way. Um, one of the things that's important to note is if you compare the same peak in two different samples, so the intensity of a feature with at the same formula in two different spectra, that may be, may be an okay comparison but there's no, no physical reason to compare the intensity of different features within the same spectrum. Because of all the reasons I've already mentioned, that means a million different things. It doesn't mean that one of those species is more present than the other species. So we 
provide that guidance. Just don't ever make that comparison on the right. But if you want to make a comparison, this one is within peak difference. And to sort of bring the point home, we have some empirical data showing this idealized case. So on the left-hand figure is this signal intensity. They're all scaled the same, which is why it's this relative intensity. For three different molecules um, at the same concentration, independently run. So it's just the pure compound in pure methanol on the instrument, nothing else. And for the same concentration, we get these wildly different signal responses. And so what you could see here is that if you just assumed intensity was directly related to concentration, then synaptic acid at 200 parts per billion is roughly as much signal as trihalose at 500 parts per billion. So this is one of the points to really bring home. In an even more extreme case, we have chlorogenic acid, neochlorogenic acid, cryptochlorogenic acid, which you may be able to guess are isomers. So we don't resolve isomers with our measurement. Those things have the same formula. And in one sample, it might be 100% chlorogenic acid. And in another sample, it might be 100% neochlorogenic acid. We don't know that. But what we do know is that these isomers behave completely differently. And so this is really, and this again is the idealized case. In the less ideal case, we took half a dozen or so standard molecules at the same concentration, and we spiked them into um, different solvents, and we added different matrices to really bring this point home. And so all of these, all of, every single part of this figure is on the same scale, but you notice that as soon as we use bond dilute matrix, and what this means is instead of using pure methanol from a bottle, that methanol has gone through the PP, uh, the SPE cartridge. Nothing else just went through it. Whatever intrinsically leaches out of that sorbent kills our sensitivity by 80%. And that immediately tells us that there's these matrix effects going on, these non-quantitative responses. And this gets more extreme at, at, at different values. So, you know, if you're me, I just wouldn't bother. I don't want to use peak intensities, it's too stressful. But it does seem to be the case that there are some instances where you can make inferences using peak intensities, but not for a single feature. So what I wouldn't want to say is that this peak is more abundant in this sample than that sample, therefore this molecule is more present. But what seems to be the case is that if you average across all of the species, and so you say, you know, all of these lignin-like molecules are more present than all of these same species in another sample, then this uncertainty seems to average out. And so one of the examples we presented in this preprint was um, calculating metrics like Bray Curtis dissimilarity between samples. And this is all th the theoretical data, but essentially on the left-hand side is for a simulated 100 peaks with known values, and we randomized their intensities. We added a random error to it. And we get this reasonably good correlation, but there is some uncertainty between their, their values. But if we repeat this for data sets with a thousand peaks, so way more features, our uncertainty spread is actually reduced. But if you look at this, this case on the bottom, which uh, I won't go into, but shows a slightly different modeling scenario, you can see that the Bray Curtis values hold true above about 0.5, but below 0.5, we're not modeling those, predicting those accurately at all. And so what we proposed in this paper was that a lot more work needs to go into this, but that there are ways and approaches. You could use peak intensities, but we really encourage you to model it and figure out if that, you know, if you're likely to fall into a statistical trap doing it or not. In terms of software for data analysis, um, this is perhaps more, more interesting in a way. Uh, there's a bunch of different tools out there. Obviously, a lot of things we mentioned, you could just calculate yourself in Excel and plot but you might want to use tools that are already built. So uh, Emsel has put out a couple of tools called FTMS R Analysis and Frida, which is a sh shiny app that essentially built on this. This tool has a lot of normalization strategies built into it, a lot of statistical models built into it. There's another tool called PyCrev, which is from uh, uh, slightly more recent, and it encompasses a Python-based approach instead of R. And it's more, uh, it's got slightly different strengths and weaknesses. And then Metabo Direct, which is a combination of R and Python, uh, which also includes some other, other features there. Of course, there's also the Shiny app that we heard about this morning, uh, or in fact, an hour and a half ago. Um, and this has a whole bunch of visualizations. And as Yuri mentioned, in the future, there will be a new Monet data app as well. 
And then the final thing I want to talk about, uh, tomorrow we have our session four where Nicole is leading a hands-on workshop exploring real data sets. And so we're going to be doing things like calculating these metrics, visualizing these data, comparing samples. Um, all of it, we're just going to use basic Python notebooks, uh, and it's all on GitHub if anybody wants to play along at home who isn't here on site today. And with that, I'm done. <laughs> yes. With all the challenges associated with this, is there any value in doing biological replicates? Yes. Uh, um, that's a good question. No, so I, I have the, uh, we have a spectrum of people at the lab and their beliefs, and I'm on the cynical uh, side of that spectrum. So I strongly encourage you to find someone who's more liberal. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think there's definitely value. So as I mentioned, there's, you know, we've got, we have this uncertainty and some of it is, is an uncertainty that can be minimized through biological replication. Um, or through measurement replication. So I strongly encourage that. I, one of the things that is really hard is to add another layer of uncertainty by not having replication. Um, I know that there's always challenges. We can only run a finite number of samples. Uh, but one of the things we have done is, you know, we always run the same QC and we've done it for years and years. So we have a really good grasp on instrument reproducibility. But biological uncertainty, I think, is, is a huge uh, thing that still should be explored. What I won't say is the, the, the thing that uh, a lot of statisticians, you know, you ask them why they want five replicates instead of three, and they tell you because five is bigger than three. And I always struggle with that as an answer because there has to be a reason. Um, so I don't know how many biological replicates you need. And I think that feeds into the upfront power analysis that you should do. So how did that interlab uh, comparison uh, help your analysis? You, 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 different standards were sent to different labs and- Yeah, so they, they, they sent a half dozen or so of these different samples to us. And I think they actually asked us to run them both by your protocol and by their predefined protocol um, to find out this variation in how labs, you know, you think there's only one way to do it, but actually there's a bunch of different ways to do it. And it was also useful just to understand the difference in the quality of data that the lab produces. So um, I think something like 22 labs were invited, and I think three or four of them weren't included in the final analysis because their data quality fell out of scope. So I think there was a lot of important lessons learned through that process. For what it's worth, I don't think we were ones that were excluded. I think we did a good job measuring it, uh, but it was for my time. So. There's a question in the Zoom. Okay. Uh, would you mind if you read it loud? It is, it is for recording. Yes, sure. Um, <laughs> Jacob asks, given that we can't interpret peak intensity as a measure of molecule abundance, how do you think we should be interpreting the meaning of average molecular properties of organic matter? Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's the question. Um, so one of the things that, that you, you just have this uncertainty. So um, one of the things that we do is we can take a presence absence approach. We can say above a certain threshold, the peak was detected, therefore it's there. You throw away the intensity. Then we can average all of those values. We can say, well, the mean NOSC was therefore this. Um, what I prefer to do, since we have the computer power to do it, is to do more like these density estimate plots and we're looking at like a NOVA type analysis where you're looking at this whole spread of variation. Um, what people have found, and this is where it becomes a little bit um, of a debate in the community, is can you do intensity weighting for these properties? And it seems that for the same reason as the Bray Curtis example I showed, it seems that in some cases it does seem to work. What I would say is that I don't think there's a hard and, for, hard and fast rule on it. I don't think there's an absolute um, no, you can't do this, and yes, you can always do it. I think it's, a, unfortunately, it's a little bit nuanced, more nuanced. Um, and Jacob's not here, so I'm going to assume I've answered the question. Yeah. Uh, when you do the molecular formula or summit, you use a confidence index or value. Uh, so I want to ask how you get to that confidence value and uh, uh, how you use that, like uh, when the value is larger than 
like 0 0.6 or 0.8, then you you are confident with that assignment? Um, yeah, so that's a very astute question. Um, so the confidence scores that we showed here, uh, these all seem to be around about 0.65, right? Um, the way that we currently define the confidence score is a combination of the mass error score, which has a value associated with it, and the isotopolog similarity score. So this means what we're doing is we're saying, how close is our measured peak to a zero error, which assumes that our peaks should have zero error. And we give that a weighting of some amount in the confidence score. And then the other part of the confidence score is how similar is are the detected isotopolog features with the theoretically predicted isotopolog features based on the signal to noise of the monoisotopic feature. So if we've got a really intense peak and it's got sulfur in it, and sulfur 34 is like 4% abundant, so we should detect that isotopolog. If we don't detect it, we get a really poor isotopolog score and therefore our confidence score is smaller. But if we have a species that's just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and it's a low intensity peak, like the monoisotopic feature has a signal to noise of 10, the carbon isotope peak, which is going to be the most abundant, might be below our limit of detection, below our signal to noise threshold. And so even if the isotopologues are there, we might not detect them because we're at low sensitivity. In that case, we also have to say we've got a low score for isotopologue because we didn't measure it, we don't know if it's there. The way that we currently weight these is very empirical. Uh, it's 60% mass and 40% isotope. And that reasoning is unfortunately a little bit arbitrary, um, but it's, it's kind of the best we can do right now. Um, and so again, I wouldn't wanna say anything below 0.5 you can't trust, but what I would say is, say you do a statistical analysis and you do a PCA or an NMF or something, you find that this formula is really, really important statistically. If that formula has a very low confidence score, maybe like rethink that. And so keep this data, but when you do your downstream analysis, go back and just check, was this something that actually I'm sure of when you're thinking about your interpretation of the features? But uh, what we tend to do uh, is anything that's like zero to 0 0.2, we might just exclude from our output list and just say this, you know, it's, it may be correct, but you don't want to build your interpretation on something that you're so uncertain about. For the today's data, are you going to be providing all of the possible molecular formulas for a peak in the output, or are you also going to provide another one like this is everything and this is the recommended by the MSTOL, like, instrument experts? That's uh, another excellent question. Um, so the question was basically, do we say every possible assignment of peak is, or do we give the, what we think is best in a sort of more conservative approach? I don't know, because I don't think that decision has been finalized, but I suspect we're gonna go for the more conservative approach, recognizing that all the data is gonna be available. And if somebody wants to reprocess it with certain principles, they can do so. Uh, but we, and I, you know, and I don't want to misspeak, and if anybody from Monet wants to interrupt me before I say the wrong thing, uh, what I think we're trying to do is err on the side of, we want people to use the data, but we don't want people to accidentally misuse the data. And so we would rather maybe give a little bit less data out, but more confident in what we give out. Yeah, I think that's right for Thousand Soils. We, um, the form that's up now does not have that information. It's certainly available for those that want it. Um, we just didn't want to confuse people that weren't expert ICR users. So if you ever want something that's not available online, just email us and we can provide it for sure. So I have kind of a related question and it may seem dumb, but I'll go straight. So why the FTICR MS? So I would say in the in the oceanography world, there are people that do FT, and then there's people that do like UPLC tandem mass spec, yes, um, which is more akin to like the biological metabolomics. 
And the argument I've heard from those people is that that secondary fragmentation helps them resolve some of those structures. Yes. Um, so was there a, dis but the trade-off is you don't get as much resolution. You have like a decimal difference in resolution, I believe. So is there a reason with the, because you stated that you were trying to be cautious, right? Um, so is there a reason that the um, Monet decided to go the FT route versus that other metabolomics route? Um, so I think and half- You can totally throw your lunch at me. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. So I think half, half of that decision is, uh, I don't want to say it, but above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> like, it's, I think there's, there's practical aspects to that choice. From a like, scientific point of view, you're, you're answering two different questions with those different techniques. So um, if I've got an example spectrum somewhere in here, eh, eh, that'll do, I guess. Um, it was in the beginning. I yeah, it was in the one this morning, yeah. So the, the problem is that no chromatography, like and people spent decades on this, no chromatography is able to resolve the real complexity of organic matter, whether that be resolved organic matter or soil or, or whatever. Um, the best people have done is a sort of functional group-based separation and petroleumics, they can separate out broad humps based on how many aromatic rings there are in their structures. But in environmental science and in, in organic matter, it's, we don't, we have, we're not there yet. So if you do LCMS, um, you're only really looking at a very small fraction of the material that's present you might be looking at things like metabolites. And so if you want to build up a picture of, you know, what is the changing metabolic profile of a sample, LCMS is probably much more appropriate because you get uh, more quantitative responses because you've got this upfront separation, you get more structural insights because you've got the fragmentation, but you're only seeing, say, for example, 1% of the diversity of species that you see with FDICR, uh, wherein you get a much broader, essentially fingerprint of the chemistry that's present in the sample. Um, so I think, you know, ideally you do both, um, but in practice, and I think they serve different questions. And I think for Monet, FDICR serves a more universal question. I'm, I'm gonna add something that Will doesn't know on this. <laughs> so Vanessa is finalizing our LCMS procedures for Monet. Oh. So we do intend to do it in addition to ICR. We're hoping that will be online February, March of this year, but we're not talking about it because it's not ready yet, but um, that's a great point. Uh, yeah. So you said you um, identified about 10,000 Peaks, right? for example, using the instruments. Yeah. I'm wondering how many percentages of the peaks can be assigned with a formula. Right, so um, it, it obviously varies a little bit. What we typically aim for um, is somewhere in the range of 50 to 70%. So on the Thousand Soils project, which used the same instrument, when we ran our Swan River Fulvic Acid QC, we were typically getting between 20 to 23,000 uh, peaks, and we were getting somewhere between 10 and 15,000 assignments, which is about 50% or so. But with our real soils, we were getting slightly fewer peaks, so maybe 17,000 peaks, but we were getting maybe 10,000 assignments still. Um, and there's a number of reasons that I don't really want to go into for why the QC behaves that way. It's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, so I would say that we're getting about that sort of 50 to 70% coverage. Um, so I had another project that I used, um, another monad, but I used the 12 test lines can I see out here, I think a couple of years ago. And we only got like 3,000, 4,000 picks, but it was 12 Tesla. Yes. Why the lower like, experience to produce lower number of peaks compared to yours. You have seven Tesla, right? Uh, so so we, we, we actually have the most FTICR, so I don't know anyone who has more. We've got a seven, two 12s, a 15, and a 21. Tesla. I know that, but yeah. there's 12 Tesla here. Yes. That's what I use it. Yeah. For my other four soil samples, I only got like three, four thousand yes. assigned peaks. I mean, assign the formula. Yes. But, but here you use seven Tesla. You could have got about like 7,000 or 6,000. Yes, from the standard formula, why would a 12 Tesla uh, produce a lower number of formula compared to your seven Tesla? Is your instrument like um, 
even a version of of, of FTF set So you have yes. Some yes. So so the the twelve Tesla that you would have used a couple of years ago is um, it's based off of okay. It's the thirty second explanation of FTICR. Basically, as I said, you've got it's not just the magnet. Um, you've got the upfront where the ionization process happens. So say for example with ESI, maybe. 1% of molecules are successfully ionized. And because of various losses, not all of them make it from the ionization source into the instrument. And on newer instruments or better instruments or cleaner instruments, that percentage is higher. So you've got this upfront thing where uh, you just get better sensitivity upfront. Then downstream, we've got the ICR cell or the analyzer cell. This is where ions are trapped for detection. So I mentioned, this time domain signal. So the ions are inside the ICR cell for one second, or two seconds. The longer we record the signal, the higher the resolution is, as well as the higher magnetic field. But ions don't last forever. We have a very high vacuum, but it's not infinitely high. And so as those ions are going around, and sometimes up to a million times a second, they're going around, they're gonna collide with background gas, even though we're at very high vacuum. And that's gonna attenuate or damp the signal. So we can only record for a certain amount of time. Newer instruments have better ICR cell designs. And so what that allows us to do is record longer signals where the ions are better controlled so that the measurement we get is higher resolution and higher sensitivity as a result. So the 12 Tesla you used to use, it has what's called an infinity cell, which is technology that's about 30 years old. Um, and it still works and it's still good, but about uh, 12 years ago, a new type of cell was designed um, called the dynamically harmonized cell. And that's what's inside the seven Tesla instrument. And that one is able to compensate for electric and magnetic field inhomogeneities much more efficiently, which means that again, we're able to improve our sensitivity, our resolution. And then the other big thing is um, just electronics in general. So, you know, if you look at an iPhone from 10 years ago and one today, and you take a picture with both of them, the picture you get today is way better than the picture you got 10 years ago because electronics have improved. And for the same reason, these instruments, the seven Tesla is about two and a half years old and that 12 Tesla is about 14 years old. And the pre-amplifier that, that multiplies the signal that we measure into a signal we can digitize is proportionately different. And so what we observe, and it was a surprising outcome because you think seven Tesla is going to be our like, you know, experimental baby, but it's actually one of our best performing instruments because it's so new, because it's got the best technology.